whatever he wants to do. We love you, Brother Herring, Sister Herring. So glad to have the two of you here tonight. Amen. Come and take your liberty in the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord, everyone. Indeed, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight, isn't it? Amen. I know that the Lord's already moved, but I feel like he's going to do some something else for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you got a Bible, I ask you to go with me to the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 17. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's just been eating away at me all afternoon. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Mark 10, 17. And when he has gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven. And come, take up thy cross and follow me. And it says, And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. O oh, Lamb of God, oh, we thank you tonight, God, for what you're going to do here, Lord. And we know you're going to move for us tonight, God. You're going to minister in this house. For this is your word, God, and we know that it's not going to return void. I just need you to hide me behind that anointing and anoint me tonight. And use me, God, for your glory. And we give you all the praise, the thanks, and the glory. Put your Bibles down to raise your hands one more time, will you? Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise God. Praise God, praise God. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you, mighty God. And you can be seated tonight. I, uh, I want to preach a little bit tonight. Praise God. The four heartbeats of desire. The four heartbeats of desire. Now, this young man was filled with honesty and love for God. He had the markings of discipline and excellent quality to have, but discipline without desire. Discipline without desire will bring dryness to the soul of every man. Amen. Inside this young man is a picture of a generation of men who had discipline but have no desire. To accompany their efforts, praise God. Inside this young man were some hidden keys that are found that could unlock the doors of greatness. Now, this young man, he, he approached, praise God, the, the approach of this young man, praise God, to Jesus. He bears attention. He comes to Jesus and assumes the posture of respect, submission, reverence. He knew that righteousness was the eternal life and the interest into the kingdom of God. Such a principle are still prevalent today in this hour that we're living in. Come on now. Come on, you believe that, don't you? I know you do. Praise God. Great emphasis is placed on righteousness. It's my belief that holiness and conduct are inseparable. 
the true relationship with God is going to affect the behavior of every man and every woman and every young person. Come on, help me somebody. God's going to affect your behavior. Come on now. It marks him and separates him from the world. This young man, he placed high emphasis on conduct over ritual. He was so caught up in his world that he had, come on now. He got the mealy mouthing around a little bit, didn't he? He come running to Jesus and telling him how much he loved him and how much he wanted to do all this and do that. But when it really got down to it, friend of mine, he began to make all these excuses. I just wonder when God begins to bear down on us uh, and God begins to try to uncover some things uh, and God begins to work uh, how we want to revert backwards uh, instead of going forwards uh, and saying, God, uh, I just want you to leave that alone. Uh, don't fool with that right now, God. Come on, somebody. You know, this first question relates perhaps to the externals of life. The second question would be asked that would relate to the internals of life. His first question was a very important question. Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? When Jesus answered the question, he resorted to the law. He proved two things about the law. The law was revelation of the holiness of God by showing men what God desires. The law defined the requirements of holiness by showing men how God wanted men to walk. Now this young man had fulfilled the requirements of the law, he still felt that there was a missing element in his life. Praise God. You know, when we don't give our whole selves to God, there's a missing element in us. There's something missing in us, praise God. That's why every service, friend of mine, we're dying out to something. Come on, I said we're dying out to something. Something's got to die out in us in every service. That way we can come more uh, like our master. Uh, come on, we can be more uh, like him. Uh, you begin to disappear. Uh, and when you look in the mirror, uh, friend, you see something totally different. Oh, come on, somebody praise him a minute. Praise the Lord. It's more than just saying that the law has been upheld. There's some requirements from God, a man that comes when one least expects them. Such was the case with this little young ruler. The second question was related to the internal issue, those things inside the soul. A lot of people can walk around and they hide a lot of stuff. They look real, real good on the outside. But friend, there could be so much stuff on the inside that God's trying to get to. But so many times we put that roadblock up. Praise God. Why don't we just let God have his way? Why don't we just say, God, come on, there's some things I need you to take. Uh, there's some things I need you to deal with. Uh, I've got some issues uh, that I don't want anybody to know about. Uh, I've got some things going on uh, I don't want nobody to know. But God, you need to work on this and help me tonight. Come on, why don't somebody, come on, tell God that. You know, there's so many that walk through life with things seemingly under their thumb while the inside is nothing but just a rolling, boiling vessel of emotions. Amen? Because we're emotional people. The outside can display some great feats, but the inside can be just as weak as water. Hello? 
Praise God. And, and those who's watching on the outside will never even know it. Amen. The young man's second question taken from Matthew's account. It says, what lack I yet? What lack I yet? You know, this question is deeply embedded, amen, within every man. But it's a question that's usually not asked for fear of embarrassment. For fear of the image to be tarnished. Uh, fear of others might misconstrue the intent and purpose of that question. Uh, how many times, friend of mine, has it been uttered uh, through prayer of desperation? Uh, how many times have you approached God uh, with tears come on rolling down your face, uh, grasping and gapping, oh, praise God, with that strong will of yours? Uh, what's this thing that's missing uh, that keeps you from gaining uh, the spiritual greatness uh, that you so desire? What lack I yet, God? This answer comes to light when we look to the life of this young man, illuminated by the Word of God. The answer is a matter of the heart, the element of desire. This young man was so highly disciplined, so highly motivated, that he fared well throughout his young life. The future held bright things for this young man. To some men, discipline rubs and irritates. Uh-oh. They work to shrug off the binding created by discipline. They are prone to resist the boundaries that discipline brings into their lives. To some men, discipline structures and shapes their lives. Amen. They seem to relish the engagements of discipline. Discipline can work with the smallest of talent and the many gifts. Do you hear me? And turn them into something uh, that the world can stand in awe of. Praise God. This account of this young rich ruler is sandwiched between two great events of life of Christ. Proceeding the story, we find blind Bartimaeus, a man who received what he needed to get from God, praise God, because of persistence. How persistent are we to get what we need to get from God? How persistent do we get, friend of mine, that when we come into the house of God and just, just say, I am not going to stop. I am not going to stop talking. I'm not going to stop calling his name. For the mind till he stops by my pew uh, and he changes everything and every situation about me. I refuse to give in and I refuse to throw in the towel. God, I've come way too far uh, to stop now. Come on. You've come way too far uh, to stop now. I said you've come way too far uh, to throw in the towel now. And then when you get to thinking about it, there's the following of the rich young ruler, the cursing of the fig tree. And perhaps maybe this is a mirror of this rich young ruler. The fig tree illustrates to us that life is full of discipline. Externally, all the leaves proved to be doing exactly what was required, but there was no fruit. In other words, it was alive, but nothing there. I said, it was a lie, but nothing there. It, it was not bearing anything. Come on, just getting along, coming along, getting along. Praise God. Come on, just showing up and knowing, friend, that you can rub shoulders. Uh, come on with somebody, you know, and there's going to be some fruit. Uh, there's going to be a blessing. Uh, there's, uh, come on now. Uh, there's going to be a healing. Uh, there's going to be a miracle. Uh, but, friend, oh, come on now. No fruit. Praise God. Let's raise our hands and worship the Lord a minute. Oh, God, in your name, Jesus. Help me, Lord. Help me, Jesus. Amen. Blind Barnabas, friend of mine, it, it's uh, the healing of blind Barnabas proves to us the importance of desire. It was the flight of the rich man full of discipline but low on desire. 
What lack I yet, God? Praise God. Dreams. Dreams are not to make men fall into inaction of imagination. But they are the steam. They are the steam that pushes their vision towards accomplishment. There are some men who have dreams that have lived out. Their, come on now. The extent of their imagination. There are other men who are willing to put feet and legs uh, on their dreams uh, and accomplish great things. Uh, it takes blood and brawl. Come on. To see fulfillment uh, of a dream. It's called desire. It was desire that pressed the widow woman through the crowd, the touch of the hem of the garment of God. It forced Zacchaeus up a tree. It drove the paralyzed man through the roof. It made blind Bartimaeus cry louder. It compelled the Cyprenetian woman to continue pleading. It made Rahab risk her life to go with the Israelites Amen. Praise God. Spiritual desires should be marked and put on our lifestyle in a place beyond the reach of this world. Inside every man, inside every man, there are four separate entities of desire. Four heartbeats of desire. They have the capacity to Make or break. They come in times of life when a man, friend of mine, must face down these forces. If that man fails to respond to the four, he does like the rich young ruler. He will leave downcast, greed because of the wealth of the possession or country. Oh my God. Are considered more valuable than the cost of the cross. Now, if that man gleans victory in his response to the four, then from that point on, the equation of his life presents her small little obstacles that he must overcome desire tempered by discipline causes one to rise above all limitations. Inside every man, there is a grave. There is a barren womb. There's a track of land, and there's a fire that'll burn until it ebbs out the body. Man, the grave that is present to a man comes on the premises given by Jesus Christ. Every man is supplied with wood. He may do what he wants to do with his wood. Some men choose to build houses with their wood, although the foundation is neglected. And then when the storms of life come, friend of mine, the house comes falling down. Amen. Isaiah tells us that others chose to take their wood and hack out small little gods to worship and then spend the rest of their wood on their own comforts. The book of Esther gives a sad account of Haman, the man whose ambition went in the wrong direction. He took his wood and built the gallows that he would die on. Yet there are others that take their meager supply of wood and form them a cross. The grave is in every man's hunger for fulfillment. The eternal graves that all men have either kill them or fulfill them. It's my choice. My wood could be spent on frivolous matters of this life or on a deadly gallow. Or I could take but a meager supply and build me a cross. A cross that has the ability to save and bring me into the throne room. To reach such a level, a man must be willing to answer let the desire take up where discipline leaves off. Praise God. Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost. That second heartbeat of desire is, has to be, friend of mine, face is the womb. There is a quest for fruitfulness in the heart of every man. 
It's the cry for revival. I said, it's the cry for revival. Give me children or I die. Uh, the quest that Rachel brought her two sons. Uh, one son would serve and deliver a nation of Israel. Uh, the birth of a natural trial, a child uh, is uh, predated by months of burdens. Days of travail. The birth of revival is no different. Jesus Christ prayed in the garden of Gethsemane for church to have a spiritual birth, then submitted his hands to the cold hands of death. Paul prayed night and day exceedingly for sinners. When Zion travails, she brings forth. The process of childbearing was marked by that mother. Come on. Such will occur when one desires, when one desires to reach into the comforts of the nonchalant relationship with God. Desire has a way of marring, come on, and figuring of a man who's willing to submit to the fruitfulness of God. Why is that? It's so imperative that we bear fruit. Praise God. I think about some of the women in the Bible, a friend of mine that, that bear children. Amen. Praise God that, that you wouldn't think that was going to. You know, revival, revival shook Scotland because of a man crying out, give me Scotland or I'm going to die. Praise God. Sometimes I think we don't put enough effort out. Sometimes I think we just run through the motions and everything, and man, you get a get a, a preacher in, and we're having revival, and come on, we run through so many things. Praise God! But I just wonder if we don't put the right effort forth to have the kind of revival that God wants. I feel like we're in the very last days right now. I said I feel like we're in the very last days right now. And if we're going to do anything and we're going to have revival, we need to have revival now. I said, we need to have revival now. I said, we got to do it now. Praise God. I feel like God's trying to pour his spirit out. Come on, friend. All across our world, praise the Lord. But there's so many people that's so disconcerted and so disconnected at what God is trying to do in the church of the living God. Uh, and they just go and run through the motions and say, well, it's just another revival. Uh, it's just another, come on, it's old Big Mouth, he's back again. And all the while, God's trying to move. And all the while, God's trying to say, I want to fill your church up. But I've got to contend with the ones, uh, praise God, the nonchalant. I've got to contend uh, with the doubters and the powders, uh, the in and the outers. Uh. Come on, somebody. It's time to get involved. Would start stop pouting and whining, criticizing. Praise the Lord. Come on. And start loving. Start loving. Praise the Lord. We're a body of believers. Praise the Lord. Supposed to love each other. Supposed to help each other. Come on, when our brother's down, we go to him and say, Come on, buddy, you're gonna make it. Just get up. Somebody's already done been through what you went through. You're going to get through this. Come on. Come on, ma'am. Get up. You're going to be all right. Everything's going to be okay. Praise God. I wonder what would happen if we got together. This is my way of thinking about the upper room. Praise the Lord. Before he poured his spirit out and those were filled with the Holy Ghost, he had to make sure that they got together for one another before he poured his spirit out. Because these were men that fought with each other. These were men that didn't like one another from time to time. 
Praise the Lord. Come on now. These were men that thought I'm the best. Praise God. Uh, come on. I spend more time with him than you do. Praise the Lord. But when they got together for one another, then that wind come blowing through that room. Uh, come on. Then clothed tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. Uh, and they all received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I wonder what would happen in this place uh, if we got together uh, for one another. Uh, You'd have the greatest revival this church had ever had. I said you'd have the greatest revival this church has ever seen. Listen, there's already been enough seeds planted. Oh, yeah, man. I said there's already been enough seeds planted. Praise the Lord. They're just waiting for you to get together. They're just waiting for you to catch on fire. I said, they're just waiting for you to catch on fire. You know what I loved about Abraham when he went to go sacrifice his son? You know what I loved about that story? He said he took his fire pan with him. In other words, he wasn't going to wait to get there to try to find something to build. He, he took the goods with him, the wood. He took everything with him. In other words, he prepared at the house before he got to where he's going. And that's our problem. We wait till we get here to try to prepare, and we don't bring our fire pan with us. But I wonder what would happen if you brought your fire pan in here, uh, and you was already prepared uh, for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Uh, my God, would friend of mine give you an outpouring? He'd give you an outpouring uh, like you never had before. you got to prepare the house uh, before you get into the house. Come on, the next time you come into church, bring your fire pan with you. Bring the fire with you. Start you a new fire around your altar at the house. Uh, get a fire around these altars uh, like never before. Boy, God wants this church to have revival more than some of you want it. Every time I've ever come here, I've always felt a great revival here. I've always felt it, man. I have. I've always felt it. When I pray for this church every day, I pray for this church and this pastor and his family every single day. I don't miss a beat. I do it every day. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. My arm's not long enough. <laughs> but when I pray, man, I feel revival for this place. And God's just waiting for you to get together. Somebody say, we're going to get together. Come on, we're going to get together. We're going to become as one. There's so many people that's living out of sync with God. Because they never can shake their carnality in this life. Carnality is, come on, is totally against, God's totally against carnality. Carnality is trying to take one hand on the pulse of the church and the other hand on the pulse of the world. That's carnality. Desire demands that we find a place of travail. Come on now, trying to find a place of travail. Or again, we'll be turned away in great sorrow, being unable to pay the price for spiritual greatness. Oh, come on, somebody. I feel the Holy Ghost here. Come on, God's trying to talk to somebody tonight. Every man's got a parcel of ground. He's been allotted a, a piece of land that he has to till. The fallow ground has to be reworked. The fallow ground's already been tilled. It just got to be, got a few clods there. It's just got to run that thing back over it again. 
because it's already been tilled already, but fallow ground just has to have something to run back over it again. And that fallow ground sometimes could be hard work. Rocks that are prone to break, the plow must be tossed to the wayside. The rampant weeds that's going to grow, friend of mine, out of control, have to be removed. It's the law of the harvest. But we spend so many times trying to get rid of the tares. Praise God that's growing with the wheat. We spend so much time and effort, friend of mine, looking at that tear. Leave that tear alone. Let God deal with that tear. God said he would deal with that, friend of mine. Let him deal with it. Quit trying to deal with it. Oh, somebody reach out to the Holy Ghost. I'm going to stop here in a minute. Oh, praise God. Amen. It's the law of the harvest. God gives sunlight and rain to the just and the unjust. Whatever one plants in his life, it's going to grow. The demand of desire proves that a man must have the proper things planted in his life. Amen. Water becomes the defining point in, a man, in the life of a man. When water comes to that seed, it's going to grow. But you've got to remember, it's got to get down through all that hard, crusty earth. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. That final heartbeat is that unquenchable fire. Some people lack the fire. They had the fire, but for some reason, it's just not like it used to be. Everybody should have a little piece of kindling they can let God blow on. A little flicker, and then it becomes a flame. Amen. That final heartbeat of desire is that flame that burns within. There's something with me that burns within for revival, seeing people healed, seeing people delivered, seeing the lost friend of mine come to God. Amen. Praise God. That's one of my desires. Paul made reference to a man who was set on fire by the fires of his lust. That man would never be one who's successful in the service of God. He will always be distracted, not necessarily by the flesh, but by the whims of his character. It's time for men to stand up and collar their flesh and feed the fires of revival. Somebody needs to tell your flesh you've dictated to me for the last time. Come on, you've overrun me for the last time. Uh, come on, you stole my revival uh, for the last time. You know, fire is often associated with the presence of God. The burning bush, the pillar of fire. Come on now. Mount Sinai. At the altar, praise God. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. I'm getting done. That fire, that fire, that fire of God can set your soul on fire. And it can lead you through your wilderness, praise God. And it can take you to the victory of the midnight camp of the Mennonites. And it can refine all your actions. It's time for us to set our affection on things above. Not on things of this old earth, praise God. I wonder if we'd like to come up around here a little bit tonight. And talk to God a little bit about your desires. Come on, about your revival.